A editora Globo apresenta Speak Up, a revista que fala inglês com você. The Speak Up cassettes are designed to enable you to understand all the varieties of spoken English. On this cassette you will hear a conversation with Harold Wilson, a former British Prime Minister, an exclusive interview with rock star Tina Turner, and the chapter from The World of English, a survey of how the language developed and the many ways in which it is used by people of all nationalities. And now here is Tom Boyd to introduce Harold Wilson. Harold Wilson, now Lord Wilson of Rivas, was Prime Minister of Great Britain for nearly eight years and served in the House of Commons as a Labour Party Member of Parliament for 38 years. He was born in Yorkshire, in the north of England, in 1916 and knew from an early age that he wanted a career in politics. From Oxford University he received first-class honours degrees in economics, politics and philosophy and he later returned to Oxford as a lecturer in economics before entering active political life. During the war he served in Winston Churchill's coalition government, and after the war he was appointed a cabinet minister in Clement Attlee's socialist government. He was elected leader of the Labour Party in 1963, and with their victory at the polls the following year, he moved into No. 10 Downing Street as first minister of Her Majesty's government. He resigned as prime minister in 1976, voluntarily handing over Britain's top job to his younger colleague, James Callaghan. The Queen rewarded him for his service to the country by making him a Knight of the Garter, one of the highest honours the monarch can give. As Sir Harold, he continued to serve in the House of Commons for some years, but has now accepted a life peerage from the Queen and confines his political activities to the House of Lords, which he attends nearly every day. I went to his flat in Westminster where he showed me some of his most valued souvenirs, two oil paintings of Russian landscapes given to him by the head of the Soviet Union, Mr. Brezhnev, a photograph of him with the Queen, and a signed photograph from President John F. Kennedy. As Lady Wilson served us morning coffee, I asked Lord Wilson about his relationships with the American presidents. Well, I knew Kennedy very well. I'd met him first during the war because he'd been at London School of Economics. And then, after I became leader of the Labour Party and Alec Douglas Hume, now Lord Douglas Hume, uh, became Prime Minister, uh, he went over, as always, to see, as every new Prime Minister does, to see the uh, President. And the President, who had been told by his people in London that I was going to win the next election, which I did by two seats out of 600, he thought it right to invite me. And I remember he said to me, I do envy you, he said. You are going to go into office, and because you're a majority in Parliament, you better carry your policies through. I know exactly what needs to be done to get the United States moving again economically. But I'm only in my first year, and in my fourth year, I'll be able to get everything I want. We'll never live to see a fourth year, I suppose. And what were your relations with Johnson? during the Vietnam War, for example. A little stormy sometimes. LBJ and I became very good friends later on. Um, I saw a lot of him, more of him than uh, any, of any other president. But over Vietnam, we had some terrible arguments. I telephoned him once. No, he telephoned me once, very pathetically. Always, like every other American president, forgetting the five-hour or six-hour difference, you know, gave me out of bed and that And... Uh, he, he phoned me and, and he said, look, he said, can't you make a gesture just to show that you support us? What about sending me half a dozen uh, Scottish um, bagpipers with their kilts and their bagpipes and all the rest of it? I said, that put, put the fear of God into them, I said, and, you know, it's probably contrary to the rules of war. I can't do that. Well, I, I'd have been in awful trouble with my own party and with many Conservatives if I had conceded anything. Now, every week uh, as Prime Minister, you have a meeting with the Queen. 
this is uh, a secret session, but what sort of subjects did you discuss with the Queen? The Queen, uh, and of course increasingly year by year, has become the most expert on the problems, on all the problems of Britain, quite apart from all the practices and so on. And she was an absolute delight to work with. The n night before, or two nights before, rather, um, the uh, Prime Minister's principal private secretary would uh, indicate to the Queen's private secretary the sort of issues I wanted to report on. It's mainly a, a reportage. Uh, though also, you do need uh, the Queen's permission, the Prime Minister, as if he's going abroad. Other ministers can go if the Prime Minister approves. But the Prime Minister can't go without the Queen's permission. And uh, oh, that led to some extremely um, amusing uh, sort of uh, encounters. And I remember on one occasion, Giscard d'Estaing sent a message. He was the, the current six months chairman of the Common Market. He wanted to grill me and find out all about it, you see. But just before I went over, she and I had been rather amused at the fact that Giscard was driving off with his car and picking up the odd girl here and there, you see. Then, two days later, I get the invitation to go and see his car. Uh, and I needed the Queen's permission. And when she saw <laughs> that, she laughed. I mean, remembering what his nocturnal habits were. And she said to her secretary, who reported it to my secretary, she said, ho, ho. Anyhow, I went over. And when I came back, I... Uh, went to report to the Queen, and she said, well, and how did it go? And uh, I said, well, I said, we made a little progress on this, but I don't think she was really interested in the details of the common market. She said, but what about Ho Ho, meaning had I been on his nocturnal visits? And I said, well, there was no Ho Ho. I don't know what he gave me for dinner that night, but as soon as I left him, I went back to the embassy and was violently sick. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that people are generally aware that the Queen has such a good sense of humor. She has, and of course now she's got the most vast experience of the whole of government and that kind of thing. At one point, I, uh, I had to go to Australia where the Prime Minister had disappeared swimming. And uh, she said very tentatively, because Prince Charles was very young then, perhaps about 18 or so, I wonder if Charles would like to go. I said, well, it would be a very good idea. I said, I'll in many years' time, I hope it's a lot of years, uh, he will be, of course, uh, the King of Australia. And she sent for Charles and said that he had to obey me on everything. If I told him to go to bed, he had to go to bed, and if he told him to get up, he had to get up, and so on. And he was an absolute success. We called him Perth, where I have, by the way, over 50 relatives, descendants of my grandparents, two of my grandparents who went over. And the prince went up to my old aunt, who's well over 90, still alive, to put his arms around her and kissed her. You know, that, that informality. And, um, oh, it was right, I mean, he, and he did so marvelously. You were on Winston Churchill's staff during the war. What was Churchill like to work with? Very good. He certainly worked hard himself. And um, he insisted that others did. The remarkable thing was that after I became a Labour MP and was appointed a junior ministership straight away, and then became a cabinet minister when I was 31, uh, Churchill still regarded me as one of his boys, and quite often, that, during that period, he would be having a drink with me in the members' smoke room. And when I resigned from the government, uh, he came up to me and he said, I have resigned from uh, the government not once, and not twice, but three times. But my feelings and, and sympathy are not for you. You've taken your decision, as I had to do. My sympathy is with our wives. Now, I want you to take a message to Mrs. Wilson. I would only presume to send her a message if I had met her, but I had been introduced to her. And then he told me what to say. And I told her, and she was so overcome. I mean, she'd gone through such a bad time and the resignation of the newspapers and the photographers and everything that um, she just burst into tears, you see. And she said, now you will thank the old boy, you see. So the, the next day, I saw Winston, and I thanked him. And the old boy started weeping. And uh, we were up again very, very late, and Mary waited up. Did you see the old boy? They always called him, and I said yes. I, and I thanked him, 
I said, and then he started to cry. I said, do you realize until two days ago I was a minister of the crown? Now I'm just an office boy between you and Winston Churchill, each of whom bursts into tears on receipt of a message from the other. <laughs> That's lovely. <laughs> what is your opinion of Neil Kinnock as the current leader of the Labour Party? I, I feel he's doing a good job. He's very, very good. I have only one criticism, and that's not of him. It's of James Callaghan and myself that we never made him a junior minister. In other words, he hasn't seen the inside of a government department except on a visit. And I, I, I think he's going to be a very, very good prime minister if Labour wins. Uh, and I think he'll be very good at keeping a team together. But uh, I do regret that neither Jim Callaghan nor I gave him a, you know, an introduction to the job, so to speak. What is your assessment of, of Mrs. Thatcher, not her policies, but as a politician? Now, she is a very able person. She had a scientific training, uh, but, of course, she, she really runs her cabinet, as I would have said no prime minister has done in modern times. She's a very good politician. Thank you very much, Lord Wilson. Tina Turner has described herself on stage as naughty, raunchy, and rough. But this is an act, she explains, conceding that someday her act might have to change. One of rock music's legendary performers, Tina Turner shows few, if any, signs of slowing down. As she nears 50, she continues to twist, shout, shake, and bounce. Born Annie Mae Bullock in 1938, she began her musical career in the early 1960s, working together with her then-husband, Ike Turner. Ike and Tina became something of household names in the period, touring with the Rolling Stones and recording soul and R&B hits of their own, such as Rolling on the River. When the Turner marriage broke up in 1976, Tina hit the road and started playing nightclubs to pay the bills. The end of her marriage forced Tina to break performing and recording contracts, which led to a series of lawsuits and serious financial difficulties. Over the last few years, however, she has made a notable comeback. In 1984, her album Private Dancer won a major award for Record of the Year. She was praised for her recent performance as an actress in the Australian film Mad Max 3, and her latest record, Breaking All the Rules, released in Brazil at the end of 1986, confirms that Tina is back where she belongs, in the limelight. Peter Panton interviewed Tina Turner for Speak Up. He began by asking her when she decided to become a singer. It wasn't a decision, it came with me. Uh, for as long as I can remember, as a little girl, I've been singing, it wasn't ha having to learn to be it or wanting. When I was just a little tot, I was always singing. Um, what sort of music did you like as a teenager? Mm, as a little girl, it was pop, because that was the radio. I mean, you're influenced by what you see. There was uh, the Maguire sisters and a lot of uh, the group singers on radio at the time. Mm. Then as a teenager, it, it became blues and R&B because that was basic and country and western. Yes. Who were your first rock heroes? The rock heroes, I would have to say, becoming knowledgeable about music at the time, of realizing that, was the Stones and the Beatles. Uh, do you think that you had any particular influences? Mick Jagger, because I, I liked... Not all of what he said, but what he insinuated, because most of the songs I took of his, I had to change a few lines because there were things that I wanted to say as a woman and things that he could say, like as being a man. So, uh, but I liked his style, his energy, and um, the projection. In the 60s, uh, rock was rebel music. The Rolling Stones, Bob Dylan, and others wrote and recorded outspoken lyrics that urged sweeping social change. What is the rock message today? I think it's a lot of fun, because if you want to talk about what Prince says, it's a little bit over the top. Yeah. I would say that Mick is still in the ballpark of just giving you a good party song, good party music to get you going. I'm talking about hot women, and, and uh, if you're getting ready for a party, Mick Jagger's music is the get you going type of music. Is it true that today's songwriters argue that romance isn't as important as material values or sex? For example, uh, Madonna in her hit Material Girl or your what's love got to do with it? <laughs> <laughs> do you dare compare the two? <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's love got to do with it is a bit more profound. Material Girls is more of a fun song. Yeah. I mean, any girls will say, oh, I would love to find a guy with money and to buy me presents. What's love got to do with is a bit of a statement because love has everything to do with it. It is definitely a foundation, a, a spiritual connection that makes peace. Also, it is uh, the change in the world. 
people don't get so hung up on it anymore as they used to. They feel that it can be secondary in some instances. So I think that the song is a much stronger, meaningful song than material, Carol. Some people say it is much easier to get noticed in the UK. There are a number of influential and widely read pop music weeklies that cover every facet of the British pop scene. BBC Radio 1 welcomes new bands, and this chuck is a free-to-play any record that strikes their fancy. Is this still a British invasion taking place in the USA? I don't think. We're only speaking of opinion. I don't think the, the front of the question is true, which was um, it being easier to make it in Britain. I find that the British audience listens, and they accept the performer for its value, value as a singer, as a vocalist value as a performer. You're only accepted if you're good. <clears throat> um, there's been, if you sort of scan the magazines, uh, announcements of different performers that has come and tried to get the British audience to go crazy simply by them entering the stage because they had a hit record. It just doesn't happen. That happens in America. So the front of the statement isn't true. I think the influence of British music is still very prominent in America. Why do you think this is so? There's something about I call it a kind of mystery because of the culture. The culture is, um, the British people are extremely conventional. They hide. I, I hope that I can verbalize this properly without offending anyone. You don't always know what one is thinking or feeling because it is basically hidden. The British people are basically let you see what they want you to see. So they put it into a song. So what is instigated, you kind of get because you don't know exactly. So it's leaving a lot to the imagination, which I think has a lot to do with us being attracted to the way the songs are written, because you don't exactly know what it means, but because it's coming from so deep, it sort of gets through with a different meaning. During your career, you mainly sung material written by other people. Do you regret not having written more of your own songs? I only wrote of a hometown, Nutbush, which is a, I, can, I think you can call it, picturesque of my past. It's a cute little community town. I, that is the only song that I've written that I'm proud of. In the past, <coughs> I was limited in my idea of uh, what I wanted to write about because there wasn't very much excitement, so I wrote a lot about what I was learning, reincarnation and different spiritual aspects I was taking on, that I'd taken on in my life. After that period, meaning in the last 10 years, I've simply been experiencing fun and freedom. I think what you can look forward to is when I do finally do a research of my writing, it will be different from what I had written in the past. But at the moment, I haven't started. I haven't started up. I have not felt the freedom to be able to write of my experiences. Uh, what about your relentless touring? Isn't that very hard work? It's really healthy for me. I, um, there's a difference in how I feel when I'm traveling and when I'm sitting still. I've been doing it for such a long time, it has become a part of my life. It gets a bit hectic depending on where I am, you know, like there's different parts of the world that's more stimulating than other parts. Well, do you have preferences about the countries you play in? Europe is my favorite. So uh, Europe to the States? To the States or to, or to Australia or to um, um, uh, different other parts of the world. Of um, the contemporary musicians, which are your favorites? Mm, it's very hard to, uh, to express myself there because I don't remember um, artists as much as... Uh, I remember music first, artists second. I cannot say at the moment that there is um, any preference. Is it true that many older fans find new rock bands hard to take? Uh, heavy metal, for example. Old fans that are you know not accustomed to this type of music. Um, does this type of rock appeal almost exclusively to male teenagers? And uh, is it true that it tends to treat women as temptresses? I my attitude about that is because it's very hard for me to speak for the public. I've learned that um, people hold on to what they like. They discard what they don't. Um, I think there are a lot of people that still hold on, that like heavy metal, like a bit of what is going on now, but it isn't all of what they love. 
and which it goes on. It's the same as with me. There are still a lot of Ray Charles, Sam Cooke songs that I, I still happen to like a lot, but then there are a lot of Madonna and uh, a lot of the, the, the female singers that I like as well. But it's like liking it with different emotions, you know. Yeah. Uh, some people say that one of the prime functions of heavy metal type of rock is to irritate parents. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, it is a rebellious world at the moment, so I think psychologically that could be true. <laughs> You received acclaim for your performance in Mad Max 3. Do you see your future as being in the movies? Um, yes, absolutely. I was very proud of the job that I did for my first straight role, first straight drama. And I think I did tremendously well, and I was also complimented uh, from the producer and the director. Um, I simply want to do it because I've, I've been singing 24 years, and there's not much more I could do with it unless I decided to learn opera or to decide to sing jazz. So that is why the, 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 the film is more important. It's because it's new. It's something to master, to conquer. The World of English, part one, of an introduction and survey of the English language and its native speakers, in which you will hear examples of practical English in action as the international language of the modern world, plus the history and development of the language from Old English to Modern English, with examples of its evolution drawn from its greatest literature through the ages, performed by leading professional actors of the English-speaking theatre, television, and films. Now here is Richard Gale to introduce you to the world of English. Over 360 million people speak English as their mother tongue, although English is numerically second to Mandarin Chinese, which can claim some 600 million native speakers, no one would seriously propose learning Chinese as a practical world language. In fact, the Chinese themselves are now busy implementing plans to learn English on a large scale. Not only would Chinese be too difficult, but its 600 million speakers are confined to one relatively small area, whereas English speakers, thanks to the British Empire, are to be found on every continent and in every corner of the globe. To a European, the English-speaking world probably means little beyond the United States of America and England. But when a European says England, he most likely means the United Kingdom, which of course is composed of four different English-speaking countries, Wales, Scotland, Ulster, also known as Northern Ireland, and England. With a bit more thought, a European will remember to include ERA, the Republic of Ireland, Australia, Canada, South Africa, and New Zealand, perhaps. But these are only 10 of the 45 countries which consider English their first or official or natural native language. In addition, there are 19 other countries for which English is the practical or educated first language. Countries like Guyana, India and the Sudan. Most of the important African states are English speaking by tradition and by choice, using English to unify the country and serve as the principal means of communication between diverse tribes. Kenya, Nigeria, Zambia, Ghana, Malawi, Tanzania. Just a few of the black African countries which depend on English for their law courts and parliaments and day-to-day -day business dealings. In Asia, the English language serves the same purpose for the entire Indian subcontinent as well as for the smaller outposts of the empire, now the Commonwealth, such as Fiji, Tonga, Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia and Ceylon, or rather Sri Lanka as it is now called. The Caribbean Sea is sprinkled with islands in the sun, Bermuda, Barbados, Trinidad, Jamaica, Dominica, the Bahamas, where English is spoken by everyone, black, white or brown. English contains many variations of accent and even dialect, but unlike Italian or German, the dialects are rarely different enough to make comprehension impossible. True, 
A London Cockney would have a very difficult time in a conversation with a steel worker in Glasgow, and a Carolina cotton picker might find it difficult to understand and be understood by a sheep farmer from Australia. But a businessman from, say, Indianapolis, Indiana, USA, would have few problems dealing with a businessman from Dublin, Ireland, or Sydney, Australia, Auckland, New Zealand, Liverpool in England, Johannesburg, South Africa, or Kingston, Jamaica. A reasonably educated standard English allows comprehension and communication all over the English-speaking world. That concludes side A of the Speak Up cassette. The world of English continues at the beginning of side B. Can you guess where these native English speakers come from? Big breakfast has always been something the English-speaking world has had in common. What is known on the continent as an English breakfast. This is also true where I come from. We have bacon and eggs as well as toast and marmalade and tea or coffee and often breakfast cereals like porridge and cornflakes. On the continent people are usually more formal, shaking hands a lot and calling each other doctor, engineer, professor and all that. The English-speaking world tends to be more informal. We don't shake hands so much. We don't use academic titles. They're considered pretentious. And we prefer first names, not only for friends and colleagues, but often even the bosses, Mike or John, and not Mr. So-and-so. Where I come from, everybody understands and speak English, but the older people also speak Patois. I never learned Patwa. I grew up only speaking English. Ever since Lord Sandwich put meat between two pieces of bread so that he could eat while playing cards, the sandwich has been the basic lunch of most English-speaking countries. At least it's certainly true where I come from. Political and social stability is something you find in nearly all the English-speaking countries. We all share a strong tradition of democratic government and a respect for the law. You don't find dictators, revolutionaries, or many extremists of any kind as a rule. Perhaps that's why there are no English words for fascism, coup d'etat, push or junta. These are foreign concepts, so we have to use the foreign words. Voice number one, and often breakfast cereals like porridge and cornflakes, was an English-speaking South African. Voice number two, often even the bosses, Mike or John, and not Mr. So-and-so, was from the Republic of Ireland. Voice number three, I grew up only speaking English, was a West Indian from Dominica. Voice number four, at least it's certainly true where I come from, was an American from the East Coast of the United States. Voice number five, these are foreign concepts, so we have to use the foreign words, was from Australia. But the geographical spread of the English-speaking world cannot entirely account for English being the lingua franca of the modern world. The industrial and technological achievements, mainly of Britain and the United States, has made English the international language of many different fields, like international air traffic control. Bahrain Tower, this is Lufthansa 146, clear to descend to 1,500 feet. This is Bahrain Tower, Roger. Turning into final approach, runway 30. Wind 320 degrees. One five knots. You are cleared to land. Runway three zero. Sea navigation. complex jargon of computers and space technology.
Advertising is another field which is largely dominated by the English language. In its modern form, advertising was an American invention, and the creative approach to advertising in most developed industrial countries shows the American influence in style and the use of language. Tom Boyd was on the creative side of advertising for many years, with large international agencies like BBDO, where he was creative manager. Tom, what about the use of English in advertising? The language of advertising is simple and direct, yet it should be colorful and memorable. Advertisers like to use a lot of idioms that are familiar to the majority of the consumers in the chosen target market, plus the use of strongly emotive words. I remember when I began in advertising, I described a certain cake as yellow. My boss quickly told me that the color yellow doesn't exist in advertising. The word, he said, is golden. Can you give us an example of the language of advertising? Yes, I picked a jingle I wrote. A jingle being a little song for advertising purposes. This one is for a chocolate bar, what the Americans call a candy bar. Market research told us that people like crunch. That is, something that makes a noise when you bite into it. People look for crunchiness in a good chocolate bar. Nougat or nuts, for example, make it crunchy. So that's why we named the bar King Crunch. Here's the jingle as it was recorded for radio and television. Have you met my friend, the King Crunch? The nuttiest, crispiest bar of a bunch. Rich milk chocolate and a whole lot of chew. A king that you can get the pearly teeth into. Ooh, King Crunch. Notice how many words imply crunchiness. Crisp, chew, munch, get your teeth into, all to fit the marketing brief. It sounds delicious. Where can I buy King Crunch? I'm afraid you can't. When it came to the point of production, there were problems with marketing and distribution, and the bar never got produced. Or, as they say in advertising, it never got off the ground. <laughs> as a separate identifiable language is over 1,200 years old. It all began with the invasion of the island of Britain by three Germanic tribes from Northern Europe, the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes in the year 499 AD, Anno Domini. Although the island had been inhabited since prehistoric times, indeed, Stonehenge was built by ancient Britain some 3,500 years ago. The beginning of English dates from this invasion, when the pagan adventurers from Denmark and the lowlands of the continent drove the native Celts and Romans out of what is now England into the mountains and protective regions of Wales and Scotland. From the tribe of Angles comes the name Englaland, land of the Angles, and the name of the language but it was primarily the dialect of the West Saxons which became the standard speech and developed into Old English. The first written records in English date from 700 AD, and about this time, Britain was invaded yet again by Scandinavian adventurers, the Vikings. After some 200 years of fighting with the Anglo-Saxons, the Vikings came to an agreement with the Saxon king, Alfred the Great, to divide the island. The Saxons in the West, the Scandinavians, who were Norse-speaking, in the East. England was therefore bilingual until the two groups, through intermarriage, became one people. The linguistic blend of Saxon and Norse was also a marriage. In the verb to be, for example, the third person singular, he is, is pure Saxon, but the plural, they are, is pure Norse. The word wife is Saxon but the word husband came from the Norse. Arm from the Saxon, but leg from the Norse. 
Duru was a Saxon word for door, but Vindu was the Norse word which gave us window. So from this marriage, one language which we call Old English. It was a very complicated language compared to modern English. It was highly inflected, that is, it had many different endings for all words, as in Latin or modern German and Russian. It also gave grammatical gender to nouns, masculine, feminine and neuter, like modern German. And not only did it have singular and plural, but a third form called the dual form to indicate precisely two, no more and no less. For example, in addition to the pronouns I and we in the first person, Old English had wit, which means the two of us, both of us, you and me, but not them. Many words in Old English are still close enough to modern English for us to understand them. See if you can guess what these Old English words mean. Thinken. Chilled. Wiffman. Muth. Nozu. Godnicht. Perhaps you could hear that thinken is the verb to think. Chilled in modern English is child, Wiffman became woman, Muth, mouth, Nozu, nose, Godnicht, good night. The next invasion of Britain, and incidentally the last foreign invasion of the island in English history, was in the year 1066. The invading forces were again Scandinavians, but with a difference. These Norsemen, called Normans, came from the north coast of France and were French-speaking. Their leader, William, known as the Conqueror, had a claim on the throne of England, and his forces were victorious. William established himself as king and set about building London's two greatest tourist attractions, the Tower of London and Westminster Abbey. Norman French became the language of the court the aristocracy of England, and the country once again became bilingual. We often say history repeats itself, and this is just what happened to the language. In the course of 300 years, Old English absorbed Norman French and emerged as one language, much as had happened with Saxon and Norse before. Norman French enriched the language and gave English its unique blend of Germanic and Latinate structures and vocabulary. This is why today we can say the world's population or the population of the world, and why only English has different words to distinguish the names of animals from their flesh which we eat. From the cow we get beef, from the calf we get veal, from the sheep mutton, from the pig, pork, and from the deer, venison. The names of the animals are Saxon, and the words for the meat are from French. This is not only interesting as a point of language, but as a point of sociology, because it reflects that the animals were raised by farmers who spoke Old English, but eaten by the aristocrats who spoke French. This merger of Saxon and Norman French we call Middle English. The first great English poet, Geoffrey Chaucer, wrote in Middle English in the 14th century, about the same time as Dante Alighieri and Boccaccio. His best known work, The Canterbury Tales, was written in 1386, and its vocabulary reflects the blend of the two language sources. Here is a bit from the prologue of The Canterbury Tales read as it was written, and pronounced as we assume Middle English sounded. A good wife was there beside de Bartha, she was some deal deaf, and that was Scatha. Of cloth making she had a switch and hunt, she passed him of Ypres and of Gaunt. In all the parish wife, nay, was there none that to the offering before her should gone, and if there did so time, so wroth was she that she was out of all the charity. Could you understand any words or phrases? Probably not. Here's the same passage in modern English. A worthy woman from beside Bath City was with us, somewhat deaf, which was a pity, in making cloth, 
she showed so great a bent, she bettered those of Ypres and of Ghent. In all the parish, not a dame dared stir towards the altar steps in front of her, and if indeed they did, so wroth was she as to be quite put out of charity. The Renaissance in 1500 brought about the rediscovery of the classics, and English was greatly enriched by a profusion of words directly taken from Latin and ancient Greek. It has been said that the greater part of the classical dictionaries was poured into the English language at this time, from Latin words like accommodate, capable, persecute, investigate, and from Greek words like apology, climax, physical, emphasis, and so on. The flood of words from Latin and Greek did not end with the Renaissance, and whenever we have needed a new word or name, we have tended to look to the classics to provide it. From Greek, aerodrome, telegraph, and telephone. From Latin, escalator, penicillin, and the prefix mini for cars and skirts, for example. <laughs> Back to the 16th century now, for what could be one of the greatest influences on the English language, the birth of William Shakespeare in 1564. Appropriately enough, on the 23rd of April, the day dedicated to St. George, patron saint of England. Curiously enough, Shakespeare also died on the 23rd of April, 52 years later. It will forever be a mystery how this man, of modest education and with no intellectual pretensions or literary ambitions beyond providing good entertainment for the common Londoner of the day, became the greatest poet of the English language and the world's most produced playwright. It has been said that in the nearly 400 years since his death, there has never been a day when one or more of Shakespeare's plays has not been played somewhere in the world. But even more important, perhaps, was his contribution to the language. However poorly educated a native English speaker may be, he cannot help using the words and phrases created by Shakespeare. They are too much a part of English. When a Tennessee housewife speaks nostalgically about her salad days when she was young and beautiful, she probably has no idea that she's quoting from Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra. Everyday phrases like bloodstained and fancy free were creations of Shakespeare along with such invaluable words as lonely, countless, and dwindle, meaning to decline, to lose importance, to become smaller. Shakespeare gave the language through his inventive genius so many words, phrases, and memorable sayings which simply didn't exist before. Few people of any education in the English-speaking world would not know the line, the quality of mercy is not strained. Here is Portia from the Merchant of Venice putting the famous phrase into context. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as a gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. It is mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes the throned monarch better than his crown. His scepter shows the force of temporal power, the attribute to awe and majesty, wherein doth sit the dread and fear of kings. But mercy is above this sceptered sway. It is enthroned in the hearts of kings. It is an attribute to God himself, and earthly power doth then show likest gods when mercy seasons justice. And scarcely anyone educated in any language anywhere in the world can fail to know to be or not to be, that is the question from Hamlet. Perhaps the line, all the world's a stage, is not so well known in other languages, but the speech it comes from demonstrates Shakespeare's masterly use of Elizabethan English, his vivid poetic images, and his ability to speak in universal truths that make the text as accurately observed today as nearly 400 years ago. Furthermore, foreign students, with a little help of a glossary for a few difficult words, should be able to understand most of the text. Certainly, 95% of the words in this passage are still in common use in modern English. 
Now, from the play, As You Like It, written in 1599, The Seven Ages of Man. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. At first, the infant, mewling and puking in his nurse's arms, then the whining schoolboy, with his satchel and shining morning face creeping like snail unwillingly to school. And then the lover, sighing like furnace, with a woeful ballad made to his mistress' eyebrow. Then a soldier, full of strange oaths and bearded like the pard, jealous in honour, sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation even in the cannon's mouth. And then the justice, in fair round belly with good cape and lined, with eyes severe and beard of formal cut full of wise saws and modern instances. And so he plays his part. The sixth age shifts into the lean and slippered pantaloon, with spectacles on nose and pouch on side, his youthful hose well saved, a world too wide for his shrunk shank, and his big manly voice turning again toward childish treble and whistles in its sound. Last scene of all that ends this strange, eventful history is second childishness and mere oblivion. Sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste, sans everything. The question, what's in a name? is another of those Shakespearean quotations that is known to nearly every native English speaker the world over. And millions would also know what follows it. A rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Listen to these immortal lines spoken softly on that famous balcony in Verona. See how she leans her cheek upon her hand. Oh, that I were a glove upon that hand that I might touch that cheek. Oh, me. She speaks. Oh, speak again, bright angel, for thou art as glorious to this night being o'er my head as is a winged messenger of heaven unto the white, upturned, wondering eyes of mortals that fall back to gaze on him when he bestrides the lazy pacing clouds and sails upon the bosom of the air. Oh, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? Deny thy father and refuse thy name. Or if thou wilt not be but sworn my love, and I'll no longer be a Capulet. Shall I hear more? Or shall I speak of this? Tis but thy name that is my enemy. Thou art thyself, though not a Montague. What's Montague? It is nor hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face, nor any other part belonging to a man. Oh, be some other name. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. So Romeo would, were he not Romeo called, retain that dear perfection which he owes without that title. Romeo, doff thy name, and for that name which is no part of thee, take all myself. I take thee at thy word. Call me but love, and I'll be new baptized. Henceforth I never will be Romeo. enjoyed the Speak Up cassette and have furthered your knowledge and understanding of English. Speak up! Speak up! In Britain.